Hello, writers. I'm Josiane Fortin, and today I'm so happy to be interviewing Holly Hughes. So Holly is the self-published author of the book, Real, Not Perfect, How to Become Your Happy, Authentic Self. So thank you so much for being on the podcast, and please tell us a little bit about you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I am an author and intuitive healer, and um, this is going to be my first self-published book. Actually, I won a contest like 15 years ago for a book of poetry and that got published too. Um, I have something traditionally published, but I'm only part of a team. I'm part of a group who worked on a comic book series, a, a horror comic, and that was called Glitter Bomb. And I wrote back matter essays. So for every fictional thing that happened in the comic, I would write like a real life version of what happened to me when I lived and worked in Hollywood. Okay, awesome. And why did you decide to write your very latest book? Oh, I'm so excited about this. I went for a walk, right? And I was walking and I was walking and I was like, bing, in my head, I was like, well, stop being a chicken. Stop just <laughs> doing small versions of what you do in essay and write the book. And I got super excited and I came home and I, I sent an email. I have an agent, my literary agent. I sent her an email and I said, I have a great idea for a book. And she said, awesome. Can you write what you have in mind? Because I knew I wanted to write it for adults, for teenagers. It was a challenge. So I said, yes. And then she and I worked together for about a year, but ultimately because of the market, we decided not to go to market with it as a team book. And then I was like, well, I have to go back to my original idea. So I went back and I wrote it and I actually love it. It came out a little chunky, honestly, the first time. I don't know what your first drafts are like, but mine are chunky. And um, I'm so glad to finally get it to this place where I think everyone can read it and understand it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think most people write uh, crappy first drafts, but you got to get it out to make it better. So it's, okay, this you one gotta was do it. Crappy. <laughs> I was like, what happened? I was like, eh, yeah, eh. but what happened? You had an agent and then do you decide to, did you decide to self-publish or did you? Yeah. So her? she and I um, worked together with a book proposal. So I always write fiction. So nonfiction in traditional publishing in the States is you have to write a book proposal. And then I had to learn how to write the 80 pages of the book proposal. I was like, I could write 80 pages of the book so much faster. Can I just write the book? But the answer was no. And I had to learn the process and it was exceedingly hard for me because it was marketing talk for the creative part. So I had to sell every chapter and I had to sell why, why am I the person writing it, which has made me prepared for now to talk about the book, but to even do that before it started, it was challenging. But for her, she just thought the market for that sort of thing wasn't very viable. And so she, she said, go ahead, self-publish. That's what is so awesome about self-publishing because like you get to be as creative as you want. Like sometimes a, a publisher will not publish your book just because of the word count, because it doesn't fit into their their book collection so that's I why so I have feelings about this right yes. I'm just like oh I'm so glad about self-publishing now I really am yeah and you get to decide everything so that's what I like about it and I want to know how long did it take you to write that book the first draft because I already knew everything because I had done this book proposal so the first draft, the really ugly, disgusting one that I discussed, um, I mean, it was beyond shitty. It was just really awful. It took me maybe four months top, three months. But the problem for me was it's kind of self-help. I, it, as an intuitive healer, that's what I also do. I usually share stories about the things that I've overcome. Um, and so I was including that in the book. And then it started looking like a memoir. It's like, what did I just do? And then I, <laughs> I really had to, to, I had to take a few months away from it. Yes. And but that's so hard for me because I'm very driven and goal oriented. I like to say, I'm going to be done. I'm going to be done. <laughs> and then I actually needed the help of an editor. I was like, I'm much too close to this material. Um, can you just help me sort my thoughts? Because I found myself 
repeating myself. But by the time I was on page 100, I couldn't remember what page I had repeated it from. I just needed help. So I got, <laughs> I got in touch with an excellent editor. I've worked with her before. Um, her name is Betsy Thorpe. And she helped me organize my ideas. And she's so good that way. And then it let me like dive in and then be myself again. Awesome. Yeah. And so how did you find an agent? I'm curious to hear about that. Ooh, so my pathway to agents was, I was a Twitter contest. Seriously, I did Pitch Wars. Do you know Pitch Wars? It used to be really big. Well, it still is. So Pitch Wars is a Twitter contest where you pitch your book and then other writers will um, read, you can submit to them and they will help you polish your manuscript. And then there's like an agent showcase. Well, for years I tried to do that and I never got in. And I was... I was like hurt, but I had started making friends on Twitter from it, like people at the same stage at writing. And then there was a pitch contest called P2P16, which was pitched to publication 2016. And it now it has a really cool name and I can't think of what it is, but it, it became another Twitter pitch contest. And that's the one that I got picked from. And it's basically, I think, other writers helped us with the pitch and polishing a few pages and there was like a website and then agents could come. Now my agent picked my thing in two different contests. So I was like, wow, I guess she really likes my writing, <laughs> but my fiction, my fiction, um, is I like writing dead girl stories. Okay. So my book on submission <laughs> is called dear dead drunk girl. And the next one I'm writing is called The Kiss of Death. So it's it's not dark, but it's definitely got a, a sense of humor that's a little dark, darker or more dry. So uh, it's been an interesting road in publishing right now because I think because of the pandemic, they really just want happy love stories. Yes, I, yeah, like feel good stories. Yeah, I just want to go back and uh, repeat what you said mm -hmm. about like, you went to the contest and participated and then you got rejected and rejected and rejected. And then at one point you got it. So I just want to tell people, yeah, like, I got rejected so many times, so many contests, like so many, so many things. I just try everything. And I just think that people need to know that don't stop at the first no. Don't, don't stop, stop at the there. first 60. Don't, don't stop then. <laughs> I think, I think what you should know is that that maybe something needs a revision. If you get no's for 60, for me, what was heartbreaking about my story was I, I wrote a really long blog post about it, but I had six R and R's. So they asked me to make edits and then return it. Um, and all of the feedback was you did exactly what we asked. Thank you. But no, <laughs> and it really was because they didn't know how to, I'm not paranormal romance. Like I like to say I belong on a shelf with like um, Gail Foreman and Nova Rensuma. Like, you know, I don't call them ghosts, but you might, but it's the, you know, it's like a little, it's in the in-between because as I'm an, as an intuitive healer, I live there so much, right? Like those are the things I see. So those are the things I like to write about. So it took me, I want everyone to know, 120 120 at, um, agents before Carly said yes to me. Okay. I love that. I love that. And what is so fascinating to you that you keep writing about dead girls? What, what is there? I don't know what's not there. I don't know. <laughs> it excites me. The whole idea of it. Um, yeah. So the, like, the, these girls, they come back to life or they come as girls? Yeah, the pitch, the pitch for Dear Dead Drunk Girl is um, what if the last words you said to someone were remembered wrong? Okay. And then, so 10 years after Mary's death, her sister holds a vigil at her grave and she raises a glass to her sister, like a, a drink. You are nothing to me when you're alive and you're nothing to me dead. And she takes a drink and, and her doing that pulls Mary down from heaven and her heaven is a dive bar because she's so full of regret. Mm -hmm. And then she's devastated because the last thing she said to her sister was, I love you, but she remembers, I hate you. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, at the grave, everyone writes Mary a letter. What no one expects is Mary writes back. So I don't know. It's it's a story about redemption. It's about um, I love emotional themes. So for Mary, it is she became what she hated. How do you undo that? So her heaven, as she you know, lets go of what her own personal pain and her own mistakes and goes on to help others, her heaven goes from a dive bar to a bar to a diner until ultimately she's in the light of heaven. And that's how the book ends. Ah. Sounds, <laughs> it sounds like I would cry the whole time. <laughs> it's this full of snark because Mary's snarky. She's a tough one. Some people are like her voice. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, uh, Yes, that's how she talks. That's excellent. I, I love it. Yeah. Um, I think there is something to the in between. So for me, like a dead girl is more like a, not necessarily a straight up ghost, but like I'm playing with um, on my next book, Kiss of Death with, with how different cultures view death and if they have different gods of death and what do those gods do and what would happen if one of them fell in love with someone. Okay, hey, that sounds very interesting, intriguing. <laughs> it's fun, it's fun. Yeah, I love it. What advice would you give to someone who is looking to write a book? Maybe he's been dreaming about it for 10 years. What would you say? Just keep writing. It doesn't matter how long it takes you. It just doesn't. It. it I know um, there's so much pressure out there. Like um, when I see tweets of people who are like, oh my God, you know, I'm 21 and I've been writing for 10 years and I'm so sad and I'm 52. So, you know, you, you don't stop existing or living or loving something just because you're older, you just have a new perspective. So I believe if you want to write a book, start with one word then go to two. And then I think you should be do something with the craft every day. So some days for me are just thinking days and I have lots of journals around me and I just jot ideas. Some days I can crank pages and pages out. Some days it takes everything to get 250 words. So I think it doesn't matter where you are on that spectrum of it in the process, as long as you keep going. And I'm a huge believer in writers conferences because I think you find community and camaraderie, like just talking about the book process or writing and I think it's a wonderful support so that yeah, I'm advice. guessing that when you get out of those conferences you're like on fire you're like I just have to write like everything is itchy my fingers need to type <laughs> yeah I think a good conference will give you lots of um cues and lots of like prompts to go like I even lead I lead one with um her name is Nova Rensuma she's also a New York Times bestseller so she writes very haunted kind of stories. So we had a workshop in Charleston, Ghost Haunts and Haints. And in it, we just focused on like scary ghosty stories. So people who wanted to write that came, we just like had a small group, but because I can, I can see dead people, so that's all the fun of it. So when we're in the haunted space, I was telling people what I saw and they were just freaking out. And then we would use that as part of the prompt. So we went on a ghost tour and um, I was telling people who I saw at what grave. And then, and then the guide was like, so when this person is here and they're like, how do you do that? I'm like, well, cause I see him. Like she's right there in front of me. So it's kind of fun. Okay. You have to tell me if I have ghosts around me. No, no, I no ghosts. You're good. You're good. Okay. Nice I'm white good. Space. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. I want to know what's the hardest thing about becoming a self-published author? What was the biggest challenge for you? I think the, the biggest challenge was my ego, right? So um, because I have been tra traditionally published and I've been out on submission that way, I was like, I'm a good enough writer. Why isn't a publisher coming to me and saying, we love you, sign this contract, magic money falls from the outside, we will do your marketing. Like I always knew so much of that would end up being my responsibility to promote the book, but I firmly believe I'm a good enough writer to do it. And that's not being a big head. That's just like, I've been at this a long time, right? I've been published a lot, like for essays and other work. So I know, I know I am, I'm, I call myself a writer. So my ego was like, I won't do anything until I'm traditionally published. 
And then when I wrote Real Not Perfect, and I really wanted it to get it to the world, I was like, get over yourself. Like, seriously, just shush, shush your little <laughs> ego, put it in a timeout, maybe a nice glass of red wine, like whatever, and a cookie that's like, but, and then I had to get down to the business of learning. And that would be, have been my second hurdle. Like I really like to understand the process. So I took time to, figure out how, how I want it to do it. it. KDP, which I chose to do, especially with COVID because no one's going to a bookstore, right? Like how do I do all that? And then just really went down the YouTube black hole. All right. What is this person's experience? What is this experience? And I think the most nerve wracking part for me was just uploading it, you know, just uploading it to make sure it got there after, you know, two years of work. It's like, is my baby there? Is she okay? I'm like, <laughs> okay, that, that was the thing. But it really, I think it was ego. I believe self-publishing exists because there are so many more stories than traditional venues to get it out. And I think people want all sorts of stories and traditional publishing has lanes. Yes, exactly. That's all they want to fill at the moment. And knowing everything that you do now about self-publishing, you've experienced it. Do you still want to go back to the traditional? Will you try to have both at the same time? Yeah, I, I like being a hybrid, you know, um, author now. I, I, I've never been one thing and I don't like being in a box. So really it fits me. Yeah, I, I like it. Um, I'm definitely going to do it again. I'm not quite sure what it is I'm going to try next. Um, I know I want to do like a workbook for the book that I just published. So maybe that, but um, also I, I love the dead girl fiction. So, you know, we'll see. <laughs> And tell me, how do you promote your book? What has been working the best mm. for you? That's such a good question. I want fairy dust. I think it's word of mouth. Honestly, I think that's what's going through. I'm going through the process of um, Amazon and KDP um, promotions. So I, I can't like share how that has been for me just yet. It's too soon in the process, but I have the most Instagram followers. I have business clients. And so it's just really been like word of mouth that way. Okay. And what is, okay, we talked about your writing projects. And so if you had one word of advice to someone who wants to self-publish, what would you need to know? It's okay if you make a mistake. Yeah, you can go in and fix it. <laughs> like inside the book or what what yeah, kind of mistake I mean, are you talking about I think about? any mistake I think that's that's the beauty of it like so the first time I uploaded my cover for my ebook I typoed my own title name and I was like <laughs> seriously because I've I'm the worst texter I always have a typo if you know me and love me you know that's just a given but I'm really I'm sure you're very fast at typing too and I looked at it but I also can't see my own typos like my yeah. eyes these beautiful glasses on my face just make the letters go in the right order and I fixed it and then I missed a ca to capitalize a letter I was like holy good goodness what is going on so you know, no harm, no foul. They, they fix it quite quickly. It, it's nice. So I think if you make a mistake, it's fine. You can go fix it. It's not the end of the world. And honestly, the only people who are the grammar police are people who know grammar. And how many people in the world know grammar? So if there's <laughs> the smallest error, I just, I just don't think it's the end of the world. Coming from a perfectionist who like cringes every time I find that, but you can go in, especially with the ebook, you can just go in and fix the mistake. With the print right. book, it has to become a different um, volume of the book, but you know, I think it's, it's okay. I think my whole book is real, not perfect. <laughs> right so right so there could be something in there <laughs> if you all find a mistake in my book email me and let me know <laughs> and it's great that we can fix it <laughs> all right if people want to know more about what you do about your book where can they connect with you 
Sure, you can connect on my website at hollyhughesintuitive.com. My last name is H-U-G-H-E-S. And on Instagram, that's where I'm really all about my business. And I'm at holly underscore Hughes underscore intuitive. Perfect. I'll make sure to share those links in the show notes. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you.